sappy and corny, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I can't even begin how much I love you and how honored I am to get to walk with you and to lead you. I mean, as I look around the room, I just, I'm just so overwhelmed. I'm, I'm in awe of God and his goodness. So many people you're all my favorites. So anyway, I'm done with that. But I just wanted to tell you that in case you ever forget. In case I don't say hi to you and you think I'm mad at you. <laughs> I promise if I'm mad at you, you will know. <laughs> you won't ever have to wonder what I'm thinking. This morning, I'm, I know I say this every week, but I am so excited about this message. I am so ecstatic. And I was, my head just about blew up as I was studying for it, but I, I'm so thrilled to bring this message. It's called The Courtship of Isaac and Rebecca, or Christ and His Church. And I'm going to, to weave that all together and kind of show the, the similarities there. But first, we do have some business to attend to. Um, so I want to start out by uh, talking about the shack. You guys are all waiting to hear what I'm going to say about the shack. What I want to say about the shack is, first and foremost, where do we get our source of truth? Where? Okay, do we get it from fictional books or movies? Okay, the second thing I'm going to say is I am going to refer you to uh, something that you can read in reference to this whole uh, topic, and that is Romans chapter 14. Okay? Get that in your little smartphone. It talks about how we just need to not fight about things and we need to love each other and we need to just trust that each person, it says, to each man's own master, he must stand or fall and God is able to make him stand. So I'm not going to make a statement about the shack, but I do want to say, be nice. <laughs> okay. The second thing is the building. Anybody want to hear about what's happening with the building? This has been our home for a while. And a year ago, we kind of all agreed that we should make an offer to buy the building. So when we went to the owner, he was very resistant and said, nope, I will not sell it for a number of financial reasons. He did not want to sell it to us. So uh, therefore, we, we have been in negotiations with him. And how many of you know that eventually we don't want to rent anymore? It's just wise to, to own. Our goal and our desire is to eventually build our own place, build it just the way we want it. And um, so currently we have a building fund, but it is not nearly enough for us to build anything of significance. So again, I want to ask you, if this is your family, if this is your home, I, I strongly encourage you to be contributing to the building fund. Even just a little bit, if you give just a little bit every week or every month, it will begin to accumulate little by little, right? That financial principle, which is also a spiritual principle. So I just want to encourage you to be giving to the building fund. Um, the, the owner has agreed to uh, a five-year lease for us, which gives us ample time to seek out land and begin to build, if that's what the Lord's will is. And from the very beginning, I know I've frustrated several of you, we have an amazing godly, wise financial counsel. I just want to say we are so blessed. Our counsel is incredible, and I'm so grateful to walk with them. And I think that I've frustrated them because I have refused to say anything until I've heard from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Imagine that. But um, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today a little bit too. But I, I just want to say... I, we don't want to go in our own presumption. We're not going to start to build a building if it's not the Holy Spirit leading us. How many of you believe that God can still speak to his kids today? Yeah. 
If the Bible says it, that we can hear his voice, then, then what? Guess, guess what? We can hear his voice. Okay, so that's number two. Um, this, the third thing I want to just reiterate, for all of you young people between 18 and 25, you don't have to be single. You can Married couples are welcome too. But I really want to hear from you. I want to hear from our young singles um, reimagining church. What would church look like if you were the boss? That's really what I want to hear. Speaking of bosses, I have a boss. I know you guys just think I'm this crazy wild maverick and I just do whatever I want, but I actually am accountable. And so I would like to, at this point, introduce my new boss and his wonderful wife, who is really just my friend. They're both my friends. Um, Would you guys stand up? And could you welcome Bill and Beth Cheney? Hello, sound guy. Can you unmute this? Uh, Bill said that he wanted to say some. These two are <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, these these two, this summer when I was just really hurting, um, before they became my bosses, um, they just came out to hang out with me, just to bless me. And uh, Jesus really did something in our hearts, I think. At least I can speak for myself. They are precious, amazing, awesome, godly people. So can you, again, give them a warm round of applause? Thank you. Love you guys. Um, Well, we're just so honored to be with you. We're not strangers to what God has uh, been doing in the life of this church for several years. And uh, we celebrate all of those things. And I just felt as we were worshiping, because I told Jody, I said, I don't want to say anything. I just want to wave and say hi. And But I really felt like the Lord laid something on my heart. And it's really simple. It's very simple. But Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And the best laid plans for inviting and including people are necessary But what really draws people to say yes when you invite Mm -hmm. and for people to say yes to Jesus when they come is that you are a worshiping church, Mm -hmm. that you are lifting up Jesus every time you praise, every time you sing, every time you worship him. And I sensed his spirit so strongly during the worship time. Mm -hmm. And I just want to encourage you, the worshipers, I want to ask you, please don't let up. Don't, don't wear out, but always lift him up and watch him begin to continue to draw people. I also want to say just how very proud uh, we are of Pastor Jody. And we've known her as a friend long before, but we are extremely proud of her and her leadership, and you should be as well. Yeah. You. You say something She's also so much fun. And when we get together in a meeting, it is really scary because most of well all of them are you know church where we could get in a lot of trouble but you know we hide it well we're good okay but I wanted to say something to you as a church body and what I was feeling during worship and it was amazing you said you know mm-hmm. that it was really and it really was but what came into my heart was a dr- uh, it brought back to memory something that I had um, experienced and, and taught on and it actually released a dream in me uh, again to go forward in something that I tried a long time ago that, that in my opinion, failed miserably. Um, the, but the point is, it, re, it stirred up a dream in me. And I felt that during worship, which was mm-hmm. awesome. And I think that might be what this church is about, mm-hmm. is stirring up and, re, um, and to being able to revisit dreams that you have. And I really encourage you to do mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. as God is speaking to you when you guys are in worship. Whatever dream God has placed in your heart, let God just bring it to life again and stir it up and um, you guys can step out in that and I know that that's what you're all about mm-hmm. is empowering Absolutely. people to walk in what God's called them to do Absolutely. And we are so thankful for you and proud thankful of you. you and if I would lived here I would so be going to this church <laughs> yay right here, right here. Thank you, love Jody. you guys love you guys all love right you. We'll take it down. okay thank you <clears throat> love you guys Uh, Thank you so much for coming this morning. I'm really honored to have you here. I'm a little nervous because I'm kind of a little loose cannon, but uh, you can't fire me, can you? Oh, okay. He's married to a loose cannon. He gets that. 
Before we go on, uh, can we please welcome our Extension Campus down in American Fork? Say hi, guys. We love you. It was so cool. Our, our staff road tripped all the way down to American Fork on uh, Tuesday, and, and we had a staff meeting with Amy and Kelly, and it was sweet. It was just really, really sweet. And, you know, we believe that God wants to do a huge work down in Utah County. Don't you believe that? You know, we have an outreach to university or Utah, wait, Utah Valley University, UVU, which I've heard is becoming the largest college in the nation, the, the biggest college in the nation. And we have an impact there. Isn't that so amazing? Woo, yes. Come, Lord Jesus. It's so awesome. And they are doing such a great work down there. We're so proud of you guys in American Fork. And actually, I'm going to out Kelly and Amy today because I am talking about this beautiful courtship of Isaac and Rebecca. So today, I also want to talk about the courtship of Amy and Kelly. And I'll just let you know right up front, I did not ask for permission to do this. So... Um, I just wanted to say that the way that the Lord brought them together was absolutely, totally God. It was so sweet and such a righteous thing. And, and I just want to encourage those of you who are young and unmarried, let the Lord bring you the right relationship. And I'm going to talk about this pretty extensively later, but I just want to say the example of Amy and Kelly, Amy... Uh, went to Biola University, and she would come out and stay in our home, and she and I became very, very close. As a matter of fact, we became so close that I began to refer to her as my adopted daughter. And, uh, you know, so she and I went through a lot together, and then one Sunday, I got a text from my other daughter who said, Amy sat by a boy in church today, and I was like, oh, Really? let me hear about this. So I didn't hear anything from Amy for a while. And then finally, she told me the whole story about this tall, blonde guy who came and sat down next to her in church. And, and then, uh, you know, kind of the little, the little ins and outs of their relationship. And she wasn't really sure if he was interested in her. And I don't know what his side of the story was, but I just told her, you know, we, have you guys heard about Blueprint? It's the class... Speaking of, of releasing dreams, you know, it's our, our life statement is we grow our life, we impact our world, and we live our dream. As you can see over there on the wall, that's a reminder. That's what we're about here at the adventure. And we teach, I t I'm going to be teaching a class called Blueprint along with Amy and Kelly and maybe a few others. I'm going to be teaching this course, and it's kind of discovering what your life mission is and what you were created to be and to do. Well, Eric was teaching the class at this point. For those of you who don't know, um, my husband of 28 years uh, with whom I planted this church, he passed away uh, almost a year ago. It was a little more than a year ago. And at the time, he taught this course called Blueprint. And I told Amy, I said, hey, you should invite Kelly to come to Blueprint because A, then you can see where he is spiritually, and B... It's no pressure if you decide you don't really like him. So as you can imagine, she liked him. She found out where he was at spiritually. And he had come to our pastor's dessert, which we now do as the pastor's brunch. But Kelly had come to that, and the Holy Spirit just did one of those suddenlies on him and just spoke to him and said, you're going to be a pastor. You're going to be a church planter. And the way that God has built this whole thing and worked this whole thing out has been just so sweet and so miraculous. And so now Amy and Kelly are married, pregnant with the little buddy, and they're going to have a baby in July, and they're tearing it up down there in American Fork, and I just, I am just so incredibly proud of them. And I'm so thankful that they were so intent on honoring God in their relationship and in their walk with him. And so today we're going to be talking about um, just another really, really sweet love story. Um, did you know that there are 904 dating websites on the internet? I just want to add, I don't know this from personal experience. <laughs> just want to clarify that. 904. Some of them are 
eHarmony, chemistry.com, perfectmatch.com, gene, par- somebody's back, right? Uh, genepartner.com, genepartner.com, <clears throat> findyourfacemate.com, okcupid.com, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Tinder, don't go there. And then in our society, not only do they have the dating websites, but they do brilliant things like The Bachelor. For those of you who are pure and innocent and you don't know what this is, this is where one man dates 25 women at the same time. Sounds totally normal, right? And to keep things equal, they do The Bachelorette, where there's one woman who's dating 25 guys at the same time. And that's, they're they're looking to find their spouse, okay? Last but not least, now I've never, disclaimer, I've never watched this, but I've heard about dating naked. (laughs) There's a show called Dating Naked. I don't recommend it. I, I have never seen it. I can't imagine there would be anything redeeming about that show. I won't ask you to slip up your hand and admit if you watched it, okay? I'm being nice today. My boss is here. (laughs) So, but I do want to say today, I'm going to talk about a love story, but there will be no gray involved in this one, not a single shade. It's only black and white. It's the word of God. So we're going to talk about Isaac and Rebecca. Primarily this chapter, it's Genesis chapter 24, and it's primarily about Rebecca. And she is a special, special woman. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more. But I want to talk with you about how this whole chapter, you know, our series has been Genesis to Jesus, finding Jesus in the Old Testament. And in Genesis, there are so many amazing symbols of Christ. And and you can find Jesus throughout the entire Bible. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And throughout Genesis, you can see it over and over. And today, what I, what I am going to try to show you is how Abraham is representing the father, Father God. And then the servant, who is unnamed, it might be Eleazar, but as far as we know, because it doesn't name him, he's, he's representing the Holy Spirit Isaac is representing Christ because you remember the story of Isaac, right? Abraham and Sarah were as good as dead, and yet they had a child. They were so old, but they had this child of promise. And after they had him, the, whole, the Lord told him to sacri- told Abraham to sacrifice his son. Remember that story? And then at the last minute, God provided the lamb. God provided the sacrifice. Classic God. So sweet. And so Isaac is a representation of Christ, and we are, the, are representing Rebecca because we are the bride. We're called the bride of Christ. The church is called the bride of Christ. So today I'm going to be opening up Genesis chapter 24, and it's, there's a lot of scripture here. There's 67 verses. I'm going to be reading it to you out of the message because I think if you're, if you're looking to do a really in-depth Bible study, the message is probably not the translation you want to use. There are others. Maybe uh, the, the most, what they call static, is the New American Standard. That's a pretty, they call it static, which means it's really, really literal. It doesn't read really flowery. But the message kind of is kind of loose, kind of, of paraphrase. And I think with a story like this, I want to read, I want to read it to you out of this Um, I do want to say I'm not going to do like this three-part sermon. I'm going to kind of give you this whole chapter and then insert little biblical principles. So I hope you can follow me. Um, Starting with verse 1, Genesis chapter 24. I would like to ask you at this point if you could get out your Bibles. Listening for the rustling of pages. (laughs) Get out your Bible app. And the reason that I want you to do this is because I'd like you to read along, even as I'm reading this out of the message, to read it in your translation, whatever particular translation you read, so that you can kind of see, you know, oh, that's what that meant, okay? 
So Abraham was now an old man. This is significant to know this. Abraham was now an old man. He was already an old man when he had Isaac, but he's still an old man. It's weird how that happens. So God had blessed Abraham in every way. This morning as I was praying about this message, I was thinking, Lord, I want you to bless me in every way. Don't you? Don't you want to be like Abraham? Spiritually, physically, emotionally, intellectually, financially, relationally. I want to be blessed in every way. So what's the secret to being blessed? Remember, we've talked about this. Obedience. And this chapter is a story about obedience. And it's so good. Back in those days, they did arranged marriages just for a little bit, little bit of historical background. In some countries, they still do arranged marriages, as you know. Um, I was at the gym, and I was talking with this one guy, and he was from India, and he said something about he had to get home to his wife. And, and I started asking, you know, so how, how long have you been married? And three months. And so um, somebody told me not to do the Indian accent, but I did anyway. Um, they had been married for three months, and, uh, and I was like, oh, how sweet. You probably can't wait to get home to her. And he's like, well, we have arranged marriages, so it's not that romantic. <laughs> but I did hear a really cool quote from an Indian man who said, in your country, you marry the one you love. But in our country, we love the one we marry. Isn't that so good? So good. So at this period of time, Abraham had been recently widowed. And remember, he had some pretty extreme and intense promises. His wife had just died. Sarah had just died. And even as the Lord had, de- had promised them that they'd have many descendants, he's looking at his son, who's almost 40 years old at this point. And he's looking at and thinking, How- I'm not going to get to see any of these descendants. So he sends his servant out to go find a bride. Um, remember in Genesis 22, 17, this was the promise that, that Isaac or Abraham had been given. I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like stars in the sky and sand on the seashore. Now think about that. He only has one son, and God is saying that he's going to bless him abundantly with a multitude of descendants. So in verse 2, it says, Abraham spoke to the senior servant or the unnamed servant in his household, the one in charge of everything that he had. And he said, put your hand under my thigh and swear by God, God of heaven, God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from among the young women of the Canaanites here, but you will go to the land of my birth and get a wife for my son Isaac. Okay, I, I, I'm not going to read too much into the text, but I think Abraham was probably kind of going, we need to get this show on the road here, okay? Now, it says, put your hand under my thigh. Anybody ever wonder, what in the world is that talking about? No, just me? I mean, like now, business transactions, you like shake hands, which, yeah. Imagine, hey, dude, put your hand under my thigh. I don't know, I just read it differently, I guess, than you do. You guys are way more spiritual. <laughs> but I, I, did, I did have to do some research on this. <clears throat> You're laughing because you probably know where I'm going with this. Okay, so in those days, because, you know, your thigh, your hamstring, is a, is a really strong muscle, apparently putting your hand under a, a, an, another man's thigh, I'm talking to you, man, into a, under a man's thigh was a sign of submission, you know, if, you're, if somebody's sitting on your hand, it's like you're probably not going to be able to hurt them. So, but it's debated. This is being hotly debated uh, because some scholars claim that this is not necessarily really talking about the thigh, but that this is talking about the organ of circumcision instead. So we're going to move on. Um, <laughs> I just want to say, gentlemen, aren't you so thankful that the New Testament now says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You don't need to shake hands. You don't need to stick your hand under his thigh or anything. So anyway, going on. Um, 
So Abraham is really intense about this. He's like, do not let my son marry a Canaanite woman. Why not? Is he prejudiced? What's the deal with Abraham? Think back. The Canaanites were cursed. It says in Genesis 9.24, when Noah woke up from his drunken stupor, he learned what Ham, his youngest son, had done. First of all, first problem, as a Jew, you do not name your son Ham. <laughs> you are just asking for a trouble. These are my sons, Ham, Bacon, and Sausage. It's a, you are asking for it, or pork chop. Okay. So you know the whole story of Ham, and if you don't know it, I can't go into it now, but this is a problem. So Ham, he totally did his dad wrong, okay? So then Noah wakes up, hungover, probably ticked off, and says, cursed Canaan, the son of Ham. May Canaan be cursed. May he be the lowest of servants to his relatives. Ugh, bummer. So from that point on, the Canaanites were accursed, So Abraham's thinking, the last thing I want is for my son to marry a woman who's cursed. I want my son to marry someone who's clearly blessed. And what this is talking about, this is a spiritual principle. How many of you have heard of the term unequally yoked? The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with non-believers. And what this is saying, I'm talking to those of you who are single at this point. If you haven't found a spouse... I don't care how cute or fun or witty or funny or kind or generous or rich or good-looking or whatever. If they do not know Jesus, run away. Run away. I can tell you story after story after story of tragedies of people who were so blinded by whatever, hormones or lovesickness that they got themselves into a relationship with a non-believer, and it was not good. So much sorrow. Don't marry someone, let me just say it this way, outside of your faith. Do not marry someone who is not born again of the Holy Spirit of God. If you claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Okay? Can I move on? Did, Did I make my point? Okay. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Starting with verse 5. Okay, so he said, don't let her marry a non-believer. Biblical principle. The servant answered, but what if the woman refuses to leave home and come with me? Do I then take your son back to your home country? Abraham said, oh no, never. By no means are you to take my son back there. God, the God of heaven, took me from the home of my fathers and from the country of my birth and spoke to me in solemn promise. I'm giving this land to your descendants. This God will send his angel ahead of you to get a wife for my son. Wow, don't you wish it was that easy these days? If the woman won't come, you're free from this oath you've sworn to me, but under no circumstances are you to take my son back there. So (laughs) the servant put his hand under the thigh of my master Abraham, I don't know why he admitted that, and gave his solemn oath. The servant took 10 of his master's camels and loaded with gifts from his master, traveled to Aram Neharaim and then to the city of Nahor. Outside the city, he made the camels kneel at a well. It was evening, the time when the women came to draw water. And he prayed, oh God, God of my master Abraham, make things go smoothly this day. Treat, treat my master Abraham well. Don't you think that's a good way to start your day out? Oh God. If you're praying for your spouse, this is a really good prayer to pray for your spouse. You know, I used to roll out of bed every morning and pray for blessings on my husband. That's just a little little freebie there. But I did, you know? I just thought, you know what? I want my husband to be blessed. And if you're married... Your spouse is your first ministry. So you say good morning to the Lord and thank him. Remember last week we talked about starting out your prayers by giving thanks. But then pray for blessings on your spouse. There's a spiritual principle involved in that. 
It says, oh God, God of my master Abraham, make things go smoothly this day. Treat my master Abraham well. As I stand here by the spring while the young women of the town come out to get water, let the girl to whom I say, lower your jug and give me a drink, and who answers, drink, and let me also water your camels. Let her be the woman you picked out for your servant Isaac. Then I'll know that you're working graciously behind the scenes for my master. And so it happened that the words were barely out of his mouth when Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, whose mother was Milcah, which actually means queen, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with a water jug on her shoulder. This girl was stunningly beautiful, a pure virgin, and she went down to the spring, filled her jug, and came up. The servant ran to meet her and said, please, can I have a sip of water from your jug? She said, certainly, drink. And she held the jug so that he could drink. And when he had satisfied his thirst, she said, I'll get water for your camels too, until they've drunk their fill. She promptly emptied her jug into the trough and ran back to the well to fill it. And she kept at it until she had watered all the camels. Now we read that and we're like, yeah, okay, cool. That's cool. She, she gave water to the camels. Check this out. In my research, I have learned the average camel drinks between 25 to 40 gallons at a sitting. I go to Costco and lift up those two jugs of milk, you know, two gallons. I'm like, oh, my bicep. Think about this girl. So do the math. 10 camels times 250 to 400. So she is bringing how much? 250 to 400 gallons. Okay, so by the way, camels, contrary to popular belief, do not store water in their hump. They store fat. And apparently, it's a delicacy in some countries. Yeah, because it's so fatty and, like, juicy. Okay, you guys are still hungry because I said bacon, aren't you? So check that guy out. That guy can drink 25 to 40 gallons of water. And here's Rebecca offering to bring water for 10 of those. Okay, so for those of you who are looking for a spouse, those of you who are single, American Fork, those of you who are single, looking for a spouse, these are some characteristics. Rebecca was handsome, helpful, humble, industrious. We've learned all of this just from this one act, right? From this one little section in the scriptures. Industrious, very courteous, obliging to a stranger, kind, generous, self-motivated, hardworking, stunningly beautiful, hospitable, ready to obey, and modest, which we'll hear about later. She was a catch. But the coolest thing is that God was the one who set this whole thing up. This wasn't just Isaac going on eHarmony.com trying to find his match. Okay, and we're going to talk about Isaac a little bit later, but here's Rebecca. She's serving the Lord. She's just serving the Lord. She's, a, she's clearly a godly young woman, comes from a good family. And it says here in verse 21, it says, The man watched, silent. Think about that. That must have taken her a while to get that much water. And he just sat there because he had just prayed that God would show him who it was. And, and, and I'm going to say something now, and I, I don't want this to come across as a harsh rebuke, but as a soft rebuke, I don't think that we ask God for enough. And I'm not talking about asking with selfish motives. I'm not talking about selfish ambition and vain conceit. But I don't think that we ask God for every little direction and everything, much less the big ones. The questions such as, who should I marry? What job should I have? Where should I live? How should I be spending my spare time? I think we lean so much on our own understanding. And you know, Eric's favorite life verse 
his born-again birthday was just uh, the 3rd of March. He was more excited about his born-again birthday than he was about his birth birthday. No offense to his mom. She's sitting here. Um, but his favorite life verse was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and I know you've all heard it. You could quote it back to me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean upon your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path or make your path straight. Okay? We can all say it, but do we live it? Do you live it? Do you ask God for every decision that you make? And I'm not saying get weird. Should I buy this carrot? <laughs> Lord, no, not that one. Okay, this one. Hey, I'm Murph, and we really hope that you enjoyed this week's Adventure TV broadcast. We here at The Adventure have two main goals, to love God and to love people, and we hope that you felt that through this week's broadcast. If you would like to join us on Sunday mornings, we have services at 9 and 11, and also on adventurehome.org. Thank you again, and God bless. All creation worships you, all we never can.